Nick Furlot, and I'm from UCLA. I work in uh, Eliezer Eskin's lab. Um, and today I'll present my paper entitled Mixed Model Co-Expression, Calculating Gene Co-Expression While Accounting for Expression Heterogeneity. Uh, and but before I do, I'd like to thank the um, uh, organizers of, of this conference for inviting me and allowing me to present my work. It's a very good opportunity for me. Um, so I'd like to start with a definition. And when I started preparing this talk, I was delighted to find that Wiktionary, which is an online open dictionary, had actually had a definition for co-expression. And they define it in co the context of genetics to be uh, the simultaneous expression of two or more genes. But for my purposes, since this talk is more statistical and computational, that's not a really good definition. So um, I want to propose another one, which is in the statistics context, uh, and that is that co-expression is a value representing the similarity between uh, gene expression patterns. And the difference between the two definitions is in the first one, you assume there's some real biological knowledge and that's implying a, f a functional relationship between genes. And in the second definition, um, we don't know that just because genes are, have similar patterns of expression that they're actually functionally related. Um, and that's really important. So in this talk, when I, when I talk about co-expression, I'll be uh, referencing the second uh, definition. And when I say, when I want to reference functional relationships, I'll just say functional relationships. Okay, so why would we like to quantify or measure co-expression? Um, so, of course, it's because we'd like to infer uh, functional relationships. And the basic flow for this kind of... Uh, analysis is that we, we um, measure gene expression using microarrays, we group genes that have similar patterns of expression, and then using these clusters of genes, we extract uh, groups of genes, which are often called gene modules, that are supposed to represent functionally cohesive uh, sets. Um, and so one of the reasons why I think this, this is a very popular type of analysis is because of the ease of use. Um, calculating or, or measuring co-expression is really, really simple because we can just use a basic Pearson's correlation coefficient. And so the basic idea is you, you measure gene expression over a number of different conditions. So we have N arrays, and these conditions could be uh, different individuals, different strains of mice, uh, different biological conditions of some sort. Um, and then for any two genes that you'd like to calculate the co-expression or measure co-expression for, you extract their gene expression values. So for gene one, I have N values, one from each array, and for gene two, the same. Um, and then you just calculate the basic correlation coefficient between the two. So in this case, the correlation or co-expression is 0 0.05. It's very close to zero. So I would probably infer that these genes are not uh, functionally related. But there's a problem with this standard type of analysis. And that problem comes in the form of what has been uh, called expression heterogeneity. So the basic idea is that when we perform a number of microarray experiments, there might be some non-biological factors which influence the measured expression of these arrays. And these non-biological factors are many times unknown, and so therefore they're not specifically accounted for in statistical models. And then the unmodeled factors can cause problems in the downstream analysis. So I think the simplest way to understand this is, is in probably one of the simplest types of analysis you can do with, uh, with microarrays is differential expression. So as you know, the idea between uh, in differential expression is you take uh, me you know, measure gene expression in condition one, in condition two, and then you want to identify genes that are uh, differentially expressed between the two conditions. So maybe there's, they're highly, more highly expressed in condition two uh, rather than condition one or vice versa. So what happens is when we have expression heterogeneity, let's say, for example, there's a series of non-biological factors which influence the arrays from condition two in such a way that they increase the expression of a subset of the genes on the array. Well, now these unmodeled factors, unmodeled because they're unknown, are going to make many genes appear to be differentially expressed, even though they're not biologically differentially expressed. So it's just noise that's meaningless to us. So to understand how the same phenomenon can affect uh, co-expression, let's first think about how we can organize our data a bit. So instead of representing the, um, the microarrays in this, this picture, let's put all the microarrays into, into a matrix um, so that the arrays are on the, on the columns, so we have n columns, and let's say each array measures 20,000 genes, so we have uh, 20,000 rows. Okay, so what happens is when we have expression heterogeneity that affects each of the arrays uh, in some way, we're essentially introducing correlation between the columns of this matrix. And when we introduce correlation between the columns of the matrix, it makes it more likely that two randomly selected genes will be correlated. So 
the introduction of correlation between columns introduces correlation between rows. And so now we have spurious correlation or co-expression. So this could have a lot of bad effects, right? Um, but for this paper, we focused on three that we thought were important, um, three types of uh, co-expression analysis where, where expression heterogeneity would have a negative effect. Um, the first is that when we, have, um, when we have expression heterogeneity, functionally related genes may tend to have smaller co-expression values than truly uh, functionally related, or, or non-functionally related genes. And when this is the case, then their ranking will be shifted, and we might not find them if, if that's how we're, um, if, if we're just doing a rank-ordered list, right? Um, the second thing is that if, if we're constructing gene modules by using the clustering method that I talked about previously, we might actually find very nice, large, cohesive modules, but they might be polluted with many non-functional gene pairs, which make it difficult for us to interpret the underlying biology. And the third is that co-expression analyses won't be replicable. And if studies aren't replicable, then we can't necessarily trust the results. Um, so with that in mind, uh, this is what the, the overall idea of this paper is, is that we introduce a method for calculating co-expression that uh, corrects away this phenomenon of expression heterogeneity. And we show that this method works well to avoid the three previous problems. Okay. So I gave you, I hope, an intuition about why expression heterogeneity would, um, would cause spurious correlation. So now let me show you a little bit more of a mathematical argument. Um, but to do that, first I want to remind you of the formula for the Pearson's correlation and then point out a relationship between the Pearson's correlation and a simple linear model. So here's the formula, which I'm sure you're all familiar with because everyone's taken a basic statistics class. Uh, here I'm calculating the correlation uh, between a vector y1 and y2, which are both genes. And on the top of the numerator, you have um, a term that comes from the sample covariance. And on the bottom in the denominator, you have um, a term that comes from the product of the sample standard deviations. So if we, if we look at these two linear models, where in the first one, we define y1 as a function of y2. In the second one, we define y2 as a function of y1. And then we test the hypothesis that y2 has an effect on y1 and that y1 has an effect on y2 by testing beta1 equal to 0 and beta2 equal to 0. What we find is that the t statistics for these tests, t1 and t2, have the following relationship with the Pearson's correlation. And so what this means is that the significance of the Pearson's correlation is exactly tied to the significance, uh, to the hypothesis test um, in these two linear models, okay? So what happens when we have expression heterogeneity is seen when we analyze the underlying assumption that we make when we do basic linear regression. And that is that we're assuming that the variance of y1 and y2 has the following form. And this is equivalent to saying that the, the individual elements of these residual vectors, e1 and e2, are uncorrelated with one another, which is also equivalent to saying that we assume that the arrays are completely uncorrelated when we condition on the fixed effects. And we know that's not true in the case of expression heterogeneity because expression heterogeneity is introduced correlation between arrays and we've not modeled this correlation effectively. So we can expect that there's going that we are, we're violating our underlying assumption of independent residuals. And when this is the case, this leads to, um, whenever you violate your assumptions, this always leads to problems. And in this case, it leads to uh, spurious co-expression. Okay. So uh, in this paper, we introduce what we call mixed model co-expression, which is a method for calculating a correlation or a co-expression value, which, um, which doesn't have this, this problem that I just talked about. And the, the basic idea is very simple. We just introduce to these two linear models a new random variable to each one, u1 and u2. And this random variable is used to account for the expression heterogeneity effect. And the key assumption is that ui, so both u1 and u2, follow a normal distribution with mean centered at zero and this covariance structure, some scalar times some known matrix K. And K is actually the, what we call the intersample correlation matrix, which is just the matrix representing the correlation, the pairwise correlation between each of the arrays. So since when we have these unmodeled factors introduced by expression, or, or introducing expression heterogeneity, we, and we know that they cause correlation between arrays, we're basically assuming that the observed correlation between arrays can be used as a surrogate for this unknown uh, expression heterogeneity. And by conditioning on that in our linear models, when we perform the hypothesis test, we're effectively removing the effect of it, okay? So there's a couple more steps 
But the end result is this. So we define um, uh, basically a correlation that is corrected for expression heterogeneity. And I put the Pearson's correlation on bottom and, and the one we define on top. And you can see that this is in vector notation, that they're very similar. And, and actually, the only difference is the, is the introduction of this sigma matrix, uh, which is a function of uh, the inner sample correlation. And so if you notice, if, if the inner sample correlation is, is, um, is close to I, is the uh, identity matrix, then it means there's, there's no correlation between the arrays, no expression heterogeneity, then the top uh, formula exactly reduces to the Pearson's correlation. Okay, so we implemented this method and examined the three issues that I talked about previously. Um, and, and so in each of these analyses, we compared our NMC method with two other methods. One is just the simple Pearson's correlation uh, applied to the, the raw data. Um, and the second is, uh, is the Pearson correlation as applied to a data set corrected with surrogate variable analysis, or SVA, which is a method introduced by Leak and Story in 2007. Um, and it's a method for correcting, correcting expression heterogeneity. Um, and, and again, we, we look at three cases. Uh, number one is um, we look at the ability of our method to prioritize truly functional gene pairs. Number two is we look at the ability of our method to discover functional gene modules. And number three is um, the ability to replicate co-expression data sets. Okay. So the first... Uh, the first one, prioritizing functional gene pairs. So for this, we, we grab the, uh, some of the human HapMap expression data. And in this data set, we have about 26,000 probes measuring some smaller number of genes. And what we do is, is we just calculate the pairwise co-expression between each of the 26,000 probes. And then we compare the relative ranking of a, pair, of a set of 732 probe pairs that target the same genes um, compared to all 26,000 choose two pairs. And the idea is that if, if two probes target the same gene, then we would expect their co-expression to be most highly ranked among all of the, all of the other co-expressions. And this might not be completely true if, um, when we have splicing and stuff, but we can assume that it's true on average. Um, and so this figure summarizes the result. Um, so we have uh, three methods again. MMC is in the red, SVA is in green, and Pearson is in blue. And what you're looking at is the distribution of co-expression ranks for each of the 730, or for all the 732 pairs. Um, and so this x-axis max out at less than uh, in the top half percent of all um, of the, uh, the top half percent of ranks. So you can see that um, all three methods place the 732 probe pairs in the top half percent of, of all ranks, all 26,000 choose two ranks. And what you also see is that um, the MMC method tends to rank these 732 probe pairs much higher than, well, not much higher, but a little bit higher than all of the, all of the other methods. And this indicates that, that our method is actually doing a better job of prioritizing tr uh, truly functional gene pairs. Okay. The second uh, type of analysis we did was uh, to identify or assess the ability of our method to discover uh, gene, functional gene modules. So we utilized yeast data for this because yeast has a really, there's really nice databases that have um, groups, of, groups of genes that have been shown biologically to be functionally related. So we curated a set of 233 functional modules and we focused on small modules of size 2 to 20. And for each, each module, we calculated a statistic which was just basically the sum of the, sum of the pairwise ranks for all genes in the module and then a corresponding p-value, which we calculated using a permutation-based method. Uh, and so ideally, for each of these, since they are, each module is a functionally cohesive gene set, we expect that the p-value is going to be very significant. So this is showing the distribution of these p-values, the cumulative distribution of these p-values. Um, so this is similar to an RSC curve. What we'd like to see is that there's a, basically this, this line jumps straight up at zero. Unfortunately, we don't see that. But what we do see is that, um, the, is that for significant uh, p-values or relatively significant p-values, um, the MMC method tends to have a high, a, a, an enrichment of these, uh, indicating a higher power to detect functional gene modules. Okay. The last analysis is the concordance that I mentioned. So for this, we utilized two gene expression data sets from yeast. Um, and these were, these were produced uh, using the same strains of yeast, uh, measuring the same genes, 
but only and in the same lab, but produced five years apart. And so what we do is just in each set we we calculate the co-expression and then we assess the concordance between the the individual co-expressions or the pairs of co-expressions. So this plot um, illustrates the result. This is called a cat plot concordance at the top. And the basic idea is that if we look at all of the most highly ranked co-expressions, we want to examine how many of those are in common between the old and the new data set. So for instance, at 1,000, that means I'm considering, at the x-axis of 1,000, I'm considering the top ranked 1,000 co-expressions. And I see that the MMC method um, ranks about, or has about 35% of those top ones in, in common between the new and the old data set. Whereas uh, Pearson has about 25% SVA less than that. And as we move out and consider more and more of the top co-expressions, these methods converge on one another. Um, but what we see is that, is that the, met the MMC method seems to dominate from, say, about 500 on. So this is good. This means that for... Um, this means that, uh, that the method seems to be uh, producing co-expressions that are more concordant between replicate data sets. Okay, so that's, that's it. Um, in summary, we showed that expression heterogeneity causes uh, spurious co-expressions. Um, and we introduced a method to correct for this phenomenon. And we showed that it performs well um, for a few cases that we deemed important. Um, and one thing that I didn't put into this presentation, but is discussed in the paper, is a kind of interesting caveat to this approach. And that is that this, this approach has the potential to correct away true biological signal. And so why that's the case is because if you, if you think about, let's say, for example, there, there are genes called master regulators that affect the expression of many, many genes. So if a master regulator affects the expression of many genes across an array, and their activity is correlated between arrays, then it means that the inner sample correlation matrix is going to pick up this correlation between arrays that's actually due to real biology. And since our method doesn't have a way to differentiate between correlation between arrays that's caused by true biology and correlation between arrays that's caused by uh, expression heterogeneity, then the method will correct away the signal. However, we think that this is actually kind of an interesting side effect because if you have the case of, of uh, these master regulators, it's very likely that you'll find large gene modules when you do the clustering procedure. And that these large gene modules might actually represent a large scale function, but they're made up of lots of small modules that represent more small scale function. So if we correct away the effect of those master regulators, it helps us to break apart this large module and examine the pieces of it. So. With that, I'll give my acknowledgments. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Hyunmin Kang and uh, Jimmy Yi, and my advisor, Elias Reskin. Um, and then also the uh, Genomic Analysis Training Program at UCLA has, has sponsored me for the past couple of years. Um, and then, of course, the ISMB Travel Fellowship. I'm very grateful to them for granting me money to come and present my work. And, um, and also all of, all of my um, fellow members of Zara Lab at UCLA. So that's it. Thank you.